So we've been here in California and the pandemic shut everything down. Around the world, people are afraid and on edge. I thought it'd be a good opportunity for the whosoever's to be active and doing ministry in this time right now. Since everything's shut down, Idaho's open, so that means we can give the gospel out and reach as many people as possible. We came up with 10,000 flyers, 100 posters, and I just charged it to Idaho. Every whosoever's trip is completely insane. Life changing. Guns, God, fireworks, <laughs> the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going down. Skateboarding. I missed it. He came up to me and he's like, dude, what happened tonight was crazy. I've been to youth group, I've been to church, but I've never experienced what happened tonight. And I said, shut your mouth, dude, okay? And I said, wait till the camera gets here. <laughs> Yeah, now I went from tour mode to daddy duty, so this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> You're like, why am I here? Why am I going through this? Why is this happening? Sometimes there's not answers to that. During this time of coronavirus, when everything's been put on pause, a lot of people were left to look in the mirror of asking themselves, who am I? Who am I without school, sports? you know, social media, friends, and all of these hobbies. God cares about the smallest details because he has a plan and he has a purpose for everyone's life. That's the message we share with the youth of the nation and of the world. He loves you and he has a plan for every detail of your life. And if you're willing to step out by faith, well, you're gonna watch God do the impossible. Keep coming, this is awesome. This is awesome, this is why I came. We're saying there's the best trick contest happening. The city doesn't know, no one knows. We don't even know if we're gonna get shut down. But as far as I'm concerned, came up with the idea, God confirmed, so I just left and we went to Idaho. Same face, not again. Ooh, Hello. Good afternoon. My dad brought me out of retirement to start teaching again. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Bjorn, happy birthday. 13, my nephew. I was trying to get you on FaceTime when the kids were awake, but you were partying, so we couldn't do it. So anyway, um, awesome. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, I would just say, want to start with to say this, is that this last year of my life, has been the most difficult and craziest time of my life. I know that the pandemic hit people in different ways. I have a sister-in-law that actually works for uh, one of the big hospitals in um, Orange County, and we've seen the rise of depression, anxiety, suicide. Crystal gave me an article the other day that they said that the um, – Opiate overdose has been double, and it was already at an all-time high before the pandemic. Spousal abuse, um, because of the pandemic, sh churches shut down worldwide. And this is a worldwide thing, right? And people left church. They've been out of church. A lot of people went back to their old ways. There's just been a, a disconnect, loss of jobs, finances, just a lot of different scenarios uh, that has happened and for me, um, I just, there's, there's been a lot of things that have been going on in my life as far as um, uh, this year has just been one of the most difficult times in my life. And, you know, you can look from the outside at people and, like, you know, if you look at me or whatever from the outside, you're like, oh, Raul Reese's son, megachurch pastor, uh, book, Bible app, TV, radio show, blah, 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 blah. But the reality is you never know where someone's at or what they're going through. Um, I went through the hardest time in my life where the enemy came to sift me. Satan came to sift me, and the amount of oppression, depression, fear. I've never felt fear, floods. Like, like when people say you get flooded with fear, I've never felt floods of fear before where you're up in your bed and you have so much fear that you can't sleep. Anxiety, um, just to a place where I literally came to my dad, and no one knows this, I'm saying this right now for the first time in these services, 
But I came to my dad in Dallas, and I said, dude, I quit ministry. Like, I'm done. I was getting so oppressed. The enemy came to kill me. I was ready to walk away from my family, my, my wife, everything. Because now I understand why when people want to commit suicide... They want to just end it all, and they just want to have peace. And they think that committing suicide will, will just fix the problem. Unfortunately, it does not. It makes the actual problem worse because there's hell and there's heaven. And depending if you're, you know how you're living, decides where you go. And it's just what the Bible says. I'm just a messenger. But what happened is it got so crazy in my life that I just wanted peace. I couldn't take any more. But that stinking Bible app kept sending me verses. And I don't even know, I didn't even know I had it on. And I never see the notifications from the Bible app. But literally, it wasn't any story. It wasn't nothing that got me through. But literally, the word, I was holding on to the word for dear life. Like my life depended on it because it did depend on it. Because Satan wanted to sift me like he came to sift Peter and destroy. He's come to seek, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has, give, uh, has come to give life abundantly. And I just remember killing the noise, having to kill the noise. I had to relearn because I was in this wilderness experience, this new place in my life that I've never been before. I thought the triplet story and all that was the craziest season of my life. No, this season made that look like a... A joke. It was so gnarly. I was literally hanging on by the skin of my teeth trying to get through the season. And I didn't share this with anyone. I was just literally going through it. And I know that a lot of you guys go through, I've been going through stuff and you're going through stuff and you're going to go through stuff. But literally what I was doing is I was literally learning how to kill the noise and disconnect and, and just listen. I remember I would turn on K-Wave. And I would listen to these studies, and I'm like, God, who's on K-Wave right now? I need something desperately. And literally on that station, every guy that got on, because it's like a different guy every 30 minutes, depending where I was at in the day, every guy that got on was literally laying it out for me. Like literally like that guy preached that message for me in that time. And then the next guy comes on, and I'm like, this isn't going to work. Boom, the next guy nails it. And the next guy nails it. And literally, the only thing that got me through this crazy season was literally, and it's not over yet. I've come through a lot. I'm not, I'm not, it's not as crazy as it was. But it's literally, it's like I'm coming out of the storm. You know when you're all shook? You know, when you come out of a storm, I don't know if you ever surfed before, but when big sets come in, you get pounded, and you think you're going to, you almost drowned a couple times, and you see the rocks and the waves are pushing you in, you're like, dude, it's done. This happened to me when I was in France. And then when you're done, when the, when the set stops, that means when the wave stops, because they come in sets, you're just shook. And you're like, I got to get out of here. Like, where is land? I got to get out of the ocean. I'm done. I can't paddle anymore. I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And that's basically where I'm at right now, just coming out of it. Like, man, I don't ever want to go there again. Poor Job. Oh, my goodness, in the Bible. Right? The examples are there. But the Word of God has become so real to me. And I feel like when you, when you see these war movies of these guys that go to war, and then they're out, and then all of a sudden the rookie comes in, he went to college, and then he learned about war, and then he shows up, and he's like ready to do this, and the guy that comes up with a cigarette and black from like bombs, dirt, whatever, and he's like, oh yeah, that's the medic tent over here, this is over here, and all of a sudden bombs start going off, and the rookie gets all scared, and he's like terrified and all shook, but the other guy's just still like, yeah, you know, go over here if you want to get some chow. And, you know, he's not even scared. He's, not, he's, he's been through it. And that's, I feel like there's been a change in me in my life that I feel like I'm just a different person now. And I just know that the word of God is so potent. And God is so real. God is so real in my life. God is so real, and what I've learned is that the grace and the mercy that God has had on me through this, because through this whole time, even though I, I would feel like I'd be drowning, like literally just coming up and taking breaths of air, I never drowned. 
I, God got me through every single situation. You're going to have to wait for book two for this one because I'm still shaking, still shook. Um, but I've learned that God is faithful. And what God does in these wilderness experiences, I'm going to get into this, this, this study right now, is that God shapes you, he molds you, he strengthens you, he builds you. And the wilderness, it's brutal out there. It's brutal in the wilderness. It's brutal in the desert. It's scary. Sometimes you don't know where you're going to get food. You don't know where you're going to sleep. Are you going to get heat stroke from the sun? Are you going to survive in the wilderness? It's brutal out there. But you learn from God because God will always speak to you as he did with the people in Israel. The Israelites, when they were coming out of Egypt and they went into that wilderness experience, God was always there. He gave them the water. He gave them the manna from heaven, whether it be coming from the radio or it come from the Bible lap. Dude, literally, I was like, boom, manna. One verse, gripping onto it. Like, literally, I know it's crazy that that sounds, but literally, that's how God was giving me my manna for today and getting me through. So, any I want to share that. I'm going to share this with you, this message. I, and I'm, I'm going to be very transparent. I'm, I'm, I got nothing to lose. I got nothing to lose, man. All I know is that whatever I share with you guys, like what I did with my book, is I'm so transparent and so honest, it's brutal. Because that's the only thing that's going to penetrate and, and have high impact. And all through that book, it's a discipleship book. It's not my story, my, my biography. It's a discipleship book. It's scripture, life application. Scripture, life application. It's going to teach you how to find God, what the work of the Holy Spirit is, what sin is, who Satan is, the call, and how God opens the doors, it's going to lead you. It's a tool, a faith-building tool that will literally put you, send you into a, a, a more impactful and, and a better relationship with God. So getting into this today, my message is called Kill the Noise. And it's going to show the effects of what killing noise does. And I thought no better person to talk about is John the Baptist, the, the, the master of Kill the Noise. He has had a high impact in my personal life as I, as I read it. I feel like I could relate to this guy so much in, in, in many ways of just like the call and the killing of the noise, be not distracted, and just being in tune to God and, 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 and going for, for the gospel, the revival, and, and to come with that message of, of repentance and, and to go to the common, the common folks, not caught up in the, in, in the, in the church. No, I'm not, I have nothing against churches, but my call is in the streets. My call is to the people outside the church. This is the medic tent. You got to get, Jesus says, go preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to oh my baby, my commandments. That happens here in the church. That you get taught here, but then you go. And that's the great commission. Get them. Baptize them. Let the Holy Spirit clean them up. You disciple them with the word of God. And then kick them out into the world. That's what you're supposed to do. And then they go get more, and then they bring their friends. And that is the Great Commission. That's how the church grows. But for my call, I like being out there. I love, dude, I love coming to the church, though, and I get to share the stories of, like, what happened out there. It's awesome because it encourages you guys. So John the Baptist, let's get into it. So John the Baptist, his story, I'm going to be in Matthew 3. You can turn there. John the Baptist, he's in all four Gospels. Um, I didn't realize that until I had to go back and, like, look through everything. I'm like, he's in all four, so it's kind of a big deal. Um, God want to know that story of the repentance story. God has been silent for 400 years from the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, to when John starts. It's 400 years. God has not spoke to his people. He was done. Imagine, like, God not speaking to anyone for 400 years. That would stink, right? I'm like, God, speak to me every day. But he doesn't do it every single day. Um, but sometimes he does. And... Uh, 400 years, and the religious system is broken. Remember the farmers of the land, the, the Bible refers to them, they're the religious leaders. They were in charge of, the religious leaders were in charge of taking care of the nation of Israel. And when I say farmers, what does a farmer do to a plant? It waters it, it prunes it, it, it makes sure it's in good soil, it makes sure it grows and develops into whatever it is going to be. And in the same way, God put the farmers, the, the Pharisees, uh, the religious leaders in charge of Israel to develop and take care of their people. That's what a, a pastor will do, is he takes care of the flock, the people. But they, they were, it was broken. They, they, they became corrupt, and it just turned into this 
dead religious system. John is Jesus' cousin, and he was the greatest prophet of the Old Covenant. He was the forerunner for King Jesus, the Messiah. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was born with the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. That's amazing. He was born with the Holy Spirit. He was in tune with God, and he knew the call that God put on his life. He didn't fit into the mold of the church or become institutionalized by church traditions. Did you know electric guitars was uh, known like it was from the devil back in the old days? Yeah, that's a tradition. Drums from the devil. Traditions. We can get caught up in, in traditions of, of church. He wasn't into the traditions. He uh, was basically, want, he knew the call that God had for him. He didn't become institutionalized by it. He was a PK. He was a pastor's kid or better yet, the son of a priest, Zechariah in the temple in Jerusalem. He was actually in line to become a priest in the mega church, in the mega temple in Jerusalem. Imagine that. He was like there. Like he was in line. He didn't. He left. He had a call on his life. He knew who he was. And he didn't just go and jump into something just because everyone told him to do it. He was in tune to what God had for him, something unique and special. And there's only one of you, and there's only ever going to be one of you, and you have a call on this earth. And you were created and designed for a certain purpose while you're here on planet earth. Everything about you was made for one unique thing. Or not, when I say one unique thing, one unique call, which consists of many things. Okay? He was created for a purpose, and he left and turned down the normal religious system that was up at that time, and he went to the desert. So he left to the desert, or they call it the wilderness. In the Bible, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been there. It's desert. There's no wilderness. It's desert. And he went and he killed the noise, and I literally take the Bible so literal that I, I read the John the Baptist story, and it says that he went to the desert, and basically, he was out there and, and waiting on God. So what I do now, and I have been doing, it's in my book, I talk about it, is when I need an answer from God, and I need to hear God's voice, he's not speaking to me, and I need a clear answer, what I do is I start a fast. I can fast one day to three days or whatever, and I'll go out to the desert, I go out to um, Joshua Tree, and I park where no one's at, and then I have a one bottle of water, and I just walk out into the desert. And then I try to look where there's, because there's like big mountains out there, and then there's like kind of larger ones that you could climb uh, that you won't die because I'm out there by myself. So I like to find a spot that I could kind of, you know, climb the rocks and get up extremely high where I won't accidentally fall and trip and die in the desert. So I go out there and I fast, and I, I take, there's no reception. Once you get into the, those gates of uh, Joshua Tree, there's no reception. But I, I put my phone on airplane mode to make sure, so to kill the noise. And then I sit up there, and I have the, the, my phone for the Bible so I could read the Bible. And um, I play some songs, worship if I want, speak in tongues, wait on God, pray, whatever I want to do. And I sit up there, hours, till the sun starts going down. And I sit up there, and I talk to God, and I wait till I get my answer. And God gives me my answer. Because when you're fasting... You kill the body appetites. Spirit, boom, comes alive. And that's when God speaks. So here's John in the desert. He has a relationship with God. He's reading the scriptures of the Old Testament because that's what he operates off. That's how the New Testament was birthed through the scriptures of the Old Testament. He's fasting. He's praying. He's a Nazarite. That means he never cut his hair. He never touched anything from the vine. No raisins, no grapes, no wine. Why? Because he was born filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens is, I've talked to, the, to you guys about this before, is when you're filled, the Bible, the Bible talks about being be filled, be ye intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. You want to be intoxicated, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit because being filled with the Holy Spirit and being connected to the Holy Spirit, you need a clear signal like Wi-Fi. So if I have a phone... And, like, this church actually has janky Wi-Fi. It's very spotty. So when I, try to up, up, when I try to upload photos and stuff sometimes, it doesn't give me my photos and my emails. So I got to go outside the church and turn on my phone reception or whatever so I can get a clear signal. Now, the problem is when you are being 
filled with the Holy Spirit and you're reading the Word of God, which is God's words, and you're praying, you're fasting, and you're in tune to God, and you're not, say, if you drink, some people drink a wine or beer or whatever, but let me just tell you about the Nazarite vow, okay? When you drink, when I drink and I drink a beer, or I don't drink anymore, but I drink a beer or wine or whatever, boom, that signal gets spotty. It starts breaking that signal because now I'm not like an antenna piggybacking off the power. I'm not getting a clear reception. And for me and John the Baptist, my boy over here, we want the power. I want the, I want the G5 or 5G power. I want that powerful signal. And in the same way with sin, it's almost like the power from heaven, the Holy Spirit, the connection. It talks about the living water. It's almost like having a fire hose or something bigger that's connected and God's downloading the water, the living water, the power from heaven. And you're picking it up and it comes, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It fills you. He manifests through you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit operate through you. And he downloads words of knowledge and words of prophecy and different things that happen when you have that power flowing. But what happens is when we get wrapped up in sin, pornography, lying, cheating, addiction, lust, you know, whatever sin is, you all know what sin is in your life. What happens is that hose gets clogged and you're not getting that full living water, that full power that we were created for. And what happens is the more that thing gets clogged, the less power, next thing you know, you start going back to your sinful life. And we know with our sinful life, Paul talks about the lust of the, uh, he talks about the, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. And, you know, you've seen these illegal dog fights where they have the pit bulls and they feed them and they fight. And, you know, this it, illegal, by the way. But what happens is if you look at that from a spiritual sense, whatever dog is fed the best is going to win. But if you starve one, that other one is going to destroy the other one. So in the same way, when you destroy the things of the flesh and you have the power of the Holy Spirit, because the job of the Holy Spirit is here to destroy the works of the flesh, the Spirit will dominate. So the whole goal is to get the clear connection to heaven and not have anything mess with that signal. Because when you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and you're picking up the signal, you're going to see things happen. And I can attest to that. So here's John. He's in the desert. Desert. He's a Nazarite. Never cut his hair. He's out there. He's in the desert. He's living off the land. He's unorthodox. He's radical in his approach in ministry. His message was straight to the point. Repent, be baptized. Turn to God. The kingdom of heaven is near. He was bold and on fire for God. Jesus said to John in chap uh, Jesus said about John in John 5:35. He says John was like a burning and shining lamp. John was killing the noise in the desert. He wasn't distracted by the cares of the world, the shiny objects that Satan likes to hook us up with and getting us off course from our call. In my book, I have a chapter called Shiny Objects. It's about Satan being the fisher, the master fisherman. Now, think about how good of a fisherman Lucifer is, and he's literally a shiny object when you read about him in the Old Testament. Filled, he's made of gold. He was one of the most beautiful things that God, great, beautiful creations that God has ever made, full of stones, hanging out, worshiping by the, by the fire, by the fire and the, the throne of God, all the radiation, just him just shining like a major shiny object. He fished, and he took one-third of the angels out of heaven, he deceived him to come with him. He got kicked out of heaven. And see, he's, they, they seen him like a bolt of lightning fly down to earth. Now, he's on planet earth. He already recruited his angels, which are demons. And if you want to know about demons, you just open yourself up to Ouija boards, tarot cards, or some gnarly music, and you'll start having those supernatural things happen to you. So he has a tackle box, massive tackle box with the best production of lures, the best shiny objects, all different kinds for deep sea fishing, for pond fishing, for fly fishing, everything for every kind of human possible. And what he wants to do is he wants to cast out and he wants to hook you. And what happens is he's done to a lot of you guys during this time in the pandemic is he's hooked you with a thing from the past. 
And what happens is all he needs to do is hook you and get you on that line, that stronghold or that foothold, and keep you from going to where you got to get off of God's call. He needs to get you on that detour route and just pull you right off and keep you stagnant so you're in the same place. And sometimes you break away. God intervenes. You break away. You break the line. You still got the hook in your mouth. You know, like you see some fish when you catch them. They still got a hook from a previous fisherman. Then he catches you again with another lure that gets you this time, maybe some hot chick. Right? You hear that story all the time. Pornography, that just goes, bam, that just blankets the whole place. Porn. Huge problem in the church. Get you hooked. And then what he wants to do is he wants to reel you in. He wants to gut you, kill you, and make fish tacos. Now, in reality, is he wants to kill you and throw you into hell so you burn forever with his demons. That's the gospel. Heaven and hell. Satan, Lucifer, the shiny object, has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give life abundantly. That's out of his mouth, Jesus' mouth. Verse 15, not verse 15, number 15. John waited on God's game plan and direction and perfect timing for this uncommon revival with the common people. He had this uncommon revival in Israel, in the nation, with just the common people like us. He was around 30 years old when he started his public ministry, so I was 32, so it's never too late for anybody. He was in tune to the Holy Spirit and listened for God's voice and seeking his will. Luke chapter 3, verse 2 to 3 says, at this time, a message from God came to John. He had the connection open. The Wi-Fi was rolling. The hose was clear. The, the connection to God's voice, he's piggybacking off the power. He's in tune to the signal. A message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized and show that they have repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. John's message, the first word out of his mouth was repent. The first words out of Jesus' mouth, repent. First words out of Paul's mouth, repent. Pete, Paul's mouth, repent. My message today is repent. And that is not just for you. That's for me. You know why? Because I'm a dirty sinner. I'm a dirty sinner, and I need forgiveness every single day. Because repenting clears the blockage from the connection to the power of the Holy Ghost. John's ministry was short-lived and was powerful work of the Holy Spirit. So let's dig into Matthew 3 with John. In those days, John the Baptist, my Bible says he came, why I wrote went, because he heard God's voice and he went to the Jordanian, uh, Jordanian well, uh, I can't even say that one, Judean? Dude, I got dyslexia. I just read that word and I can't even say it. I've been saying it all morning. Judean wilderness uh, and began preaching. In what days? Those days when it's been silent for 400 years, the sky arises and he starts preaching in the wilderness. Now think about this. When you go to Israel and you go to where John the Baptist was baptizing, it's like desert. There's nothing there but water. But our tour guide was talking about it. I said, I'd never heard this taught before, but our tour guide said, guys, this looks like there's nothing out here. He's all, this is a major highway. I'm like, what? He's like, yes. He's like, this path is where people would come from Europe. People would come from Asia. They'd come right through this thing. And when you're in the desert, you want to be by the water. It says that John went from both sides of the water, of the, of the Jordan River. They come right down through this path through Israel into Africa. It was a major highway. So let's look at it nowadays. It's like being in downtown L.A. where the 110, the 5, the 60, the 10, 405, everything just meets in one area. It was a major highway back then where John was in the wilderness living, preaching the gospel of repentance. His message was repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. What is repent? Is it these people at rock concerts or whatever concerts, and they're holding their signs up, and they're, repent, God hates you, God hates gay people, God hates you, because you come to this concert, you're all going to burn and go to hell. Well, from what I read in the scriptures um, of John the Baptist, it, it talks about him saying to the tax collectors, hey, if you're cheating people, stop cheating people. Hey, 
let's just talk nowadays. Hey, if you're watching porn, stop watching porn. Hey, if you're using drugs and alcohol, stop using drugs and alcohol. If you don't have a relationship with God, come to God. Repent basically means to change your heart and mind in the direction you are going. So in my book, obviously, I talk about that in my, when I was on a skateboard tour, managing a professional skateboard team, I did too much cocaine and alcohol and Xanax, and I OD'd. From that next day, I woke up, and I repented. I said, God, forgive me my sins. I'm so sorry. I'm just so empty. I'm so tired. These shiny objects, the Bible talks about the, pride of, the lust of the flesh, the pride of, I'm messing up. This is third service. The lust of the eye, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. I was tired of these things, and I repented. That means I changed my heart and mind, and I quit going in that direction. And I made a, a, a plan to go in that direction. It's like driving a car, and when you're living this lifestyle, like, you know, when you're caught up in sin, you're, you're, you feel miserable because you're always empty. Because sin is fun for a season. It's like cotton candy. It looks good. You're like, I'll take that big old pink cotton candy at Disneyland. And then you bite, you take a big bite of it, you're like, this thing's going to fill me. You take this huge bite, you put it in your mouth, it dissolves in little pebbles. So you take another big bite, it dissolves in little pebbles. And you keep doing this, and then finally, you're sick, and you're like, take, finish the bag. Finish the bag, right? Sin is like that. Let's go to Vegas. Let's go. We're popping it off. Someone's getting married. We're hitting the strip clubs. We're going to go gamble. Boom, you lose 10 grand. You can't redo that bathroom downstairs in your house. True story. Um, you got alcohol poisoning in the back of a Honda Civic with no tinted windows, and you're coming back from Vegas when it's 120 degrees out. True story. Sin is fun for a season, but the end is death. So another illustration, you're driving your car, and you know you're going to go off the cliff because you know that what's where sin leads to leads to death. So instead of going off the cliff, just flip a U-turn. That's repentance. Flip a U-E. Turn around. Go to God. And God the Father, when you come home, he's just sitting there waiting. Because he loves you to death, to death of the cross. That's why he died on the cross. That any of us that would believe by faith that he died and he raised again, he will give you life abundantly. He'll forgive you of all your sins. And if you're a dirty sinner like me and the things that I've done, <laughs> no one has to tell you're a sinner. God loves you, though. This is why he died, so that we can have life abundantly, and he will clean you straight instantly. So then it says this, verse 3, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, his vo he's a voice shouted in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the roads for him. So back in those days, kings, when they would come to town, they were, they were like rappers. They wrote their entourage, right? So you got your security. You got your cooks. You got your probably concubines. <laughs> concubines. They had all kinds of crazy stuff, right? They rolled deep. Let's just say that. So when they're going into town, if they were, in, if they were here in Diamond Bar and they wanted to go to L.A., what they would do is they're like, okay, this mountain's in the way. We got an entourage. We, you know, we, we're not trying to go up and catch a 10 freeway. We're trying to go straight shot. So they're like, king's like, level it. So they'll make, they'll, they'll make a path through that hill flatten it out. If there's potholes, they're going to fill them in so the chariots don't break down or the horses get injured. You know, uh, if there's a crooked path, they're going to make it straight. They're going to make it a straight shot for the king to get to the city first class. Now, John the Baptist, in the spiritual sense, his whole deal was that he was a forerunner spiritually to be a, a, an, uh, to be a person that will point people to Jesus. So the way he conducted himself, the way he lived his life, the way you look at him in these conversations, the way he was, he should point sh a straight shot to Jesus. And that's why we call ourselves Christians. People in the New Testament were named Christians because they were Christ-like. Now, let's flip it. Now, my question to you is, are we a straight path? Are we making the crooked path straight to Jesus being called Christians? Or are we making the straight path crooked by the way we're living. When people look at our lives, are we putting obstacles in their life? Are we leading them off on detour routes? Are we pushing them away so the enemy could hook them? Are we putting potholes so they're tripping up on our faith because they're looking at our lives and it's not adding up? Are we being true Christians? Now remember, the biggest poser in the Bible was Judas. 
He rolled with Jesus. He heard the disciples. He, he, rolled, he looked like them. He talked to Christianese. He heard the best Bible studies. He saw the miracles. He was with the 12. But yet, at the end of the day, he was a fake and a phony and a big poser. And I'm a skateboarder. The last thing you want to be is a poser. That's the last thing you ever want to be is a poser. So do we make the crooked path straight or the straight path crooked? Now I want to revert really quick. Remember, there's grace and mercy. There's grace and mercy. God loves us, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, he gets us on track. We're not perfect. We're all in different places in our walk, to be clear. We're in different places in our walk and spiritually, and some people are here that you might, you might be stripping right now to make money to pay the bills, and someone invited you to church. Some people just got off drugs. Some people just kicking porn for some dad or, or mom is just kicking porn. We're all in different places, and there's grace and mercy. But what happens is when you're, when you're saying you're something and you continue to live a life of sin, I hate to say it, but you're a hypocrite or a poser. This is what the Bible teaches. And this is why it's so important to repent. Because when you repent and you understand the grace of God, that's when you receive the peace of God. And it's the most amazing feeling. Verse 4, it says this, John's clothes were woven from camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and for food, he ate locusts and honey. And every time I read this story, I always think of that, that caveman in the Geico commercials. You know what I'm saying? This dude was out there in the desert. The desert will weather you. It will weather you. The sun will bake you. You know, this dude never cut his hair. His hair would probably look crazy. I mean, I know that uh, Samson, he was a Nazarene. He had, it says he had uh, seven locks, so he probably had dreadlocks. Um, he didn't obey the law, but not drinking. <laughs> he just went, chased women and got drunk the whole time. Um, but God's grace on his life as well. But this is the whole thing. Basically, this guy, John the Baptist, was out there in the desert. He, he basically lived off the land. He was a simple guy. He wasn't caught up in the shiny objects. And he just spent that time waiting on God for his perfect call, and God used him in a very powerful way. People from Jerusalem and from all over the, uh, the Judean, uh, Judah, sorry, people from Jerusalem and from all over Judah and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. When they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Now imagine this. This guy was born, he was filled with the Holy Spirit from a young age, and even people were like, something's up with this kid. Something special is going to happen with this kid. He had the Holy Spirit in him. The Holy Spirit was with him, and when he would speak, just the Holy Spirit would probably be working, and people were just, it was this huge spiritual revival happening, and people were confessing their sins. They were getting baptized. It was a major revival and a spiritual awakening happening in Israel, down by the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them and he said, you brood of snakes. That's like saying, you sons of poison, you sons of snakes spitting all that poison, just called them out. He said, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? That is like hardcore right there, right? These are like the city boys coming out to the desert and this is the religious system. They wore their white robes. They looked, you know, head, head to toe, you know, money, right? They show up, and he's just like, who called you guys out here? You brood of snakes? They're probably like, who is this caveman talking to us, right? Now, Jesus also had some words about these fellas. Now, the Pharisees, they were the religious people at that time, and they were, they were putting all these, bearing all these like these hardcore laws and traditions on the people that the people couldn't bear, nor could they. Jesus, and they were ripping off God's people. They wouldn't have let the poor people come in with their, with their um, lambs or whatever into the temple to sacrifice, to, 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 work, to pay atonement for their uh, sins in the temple. They would tax them with the, the city shekel and make them pay more and make them buy their stuff. They were just basically making money off the poor people. Then on top of it, Jesus said... You guys are a bunch of hypocrites. He also, there's in the, in the scriptures, talks about calling them, uh, you guys are corrupt. He was calling them whitewashed tombs. Back in Israel, what would happen is uh, when someone would get buried, they'd bury them in the side of the mountain, and then they would bleach the outside. They'd put a rock in front of it, and they'd bleach it. 
so it'd be white, so it looked all clean and nice. But yet inside it was dead bones, and Jesus called them. You guys are like whitewashed tombs. You guys are dead and corrupt inside. So here's John the Baptist, and he calls them out, and he says, you brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove it by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Basically, he's telling them a bunch of sinners, and they're fakes and posers. I mean, this is like hardcore stuff right here, this, this guy, John the Baptist. He says, don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God created children out of Abraham from these very stones. Basically saying, just because you're born in America doesn't mean you're a Christian. I'm American, man. I'm Christian. Do my mom and dad are Christians? I got the faith. Or... I go to Calvary Chapel every week and I hear Dr. Raul Reeves. No, doesn't mean nothing. I give money to the church. No. I go on Christmas and Easter and I go for all the big holidays. I'm a Christian. Nope. That doesn't mean nothing. It's all about a relationship and the true way to show that you are a Christian is fruits of repentance. The transformed life. There has to be a shift in your life. If you're a Christian right now, and you, I'd say I've been a Christian for six years, and you're still doing the same stuff you've been doing six years ago, that's not what the Bible says. And we're going to get into this right now and, and talk about the sanctification process and the power of the Holy Ghost. He says, even now, the acts of God's judgment is poised, ready to serve the root of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. So basically, if you're not showing fruits of repentance, the transformed life, he's saying it's going to be chopped down and thrown into the fire. It's no good. The tree is no good. So this is what Jesus says in Matthew in the Beatitudes. He says this in in chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus says, You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. So he says the narrow gate to to, to get to heaven. Okay, it's narrow. The highway to hell is broad, and its gates is wide, and many choose that way. People choose to go to hell. Well, it's easy to go to hell. It's, it's 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 a wide gate. It's like getting in your car and just jumping on the freeway and hitting cruise control. Just go along with everything that they're talking about in the world and just buy into it. Just buy into it and take it all in, and that's the easy way. Now, you want to get to heaven, it's like climbing Mount Baldy on that trail. And Jesus says it here. He says, but the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only few ever find it. Why, Why do few only ever find it? Because in order to get to heaven, you have to turn from your selfish ways, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. It's difficult to kill the body appetites and live the spirit-led life because you can't do it by yourself. It has to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. So through repentance and belief in the Son, dying on the cross, and asking for the forgiveness of sins, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And the sanctification process, what I talk about in my book, is he starts transforming you from the inside out. It's not about the outside. God don't care about all this. He wants your heart. Uh, that, this is religion on the outside. Oh, yeah, I looked the part. Yep, yep. No. A relationship is the heart issue. Then he goes on to say about trees. Beware of false prophets who come disguised and harmless as sheep, but they really are vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. This is by the way they act. You can identify people by the way they act. You can pick, can you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from a thistle? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Hell, okay? Yes, just as you identify A tree by its fruits, you can identify a person by their actions. Then just do inventory on our lives. And us as Christians, we know when we're getting off, right? The Holy Spirit throws a stop sign like, "Mm mm-mm, Ryan, you need to chill out. You you, you don't don't, don't say things like that, you know, or just little things, or you don't act like that. Holy Spirit gives us stop signs. 
And those warnings, that's because the person of the Holy Spirit, when you give your life to him, it's a person. But he's the Holy Ghost, as it talks about in the Old Testament or in the, in the King James Version. Imagine a person of the Holy Spirit in bodily form is inside of you. So he's with you. He's, behind, he's with you behind closed doors. It's not like I'm going to leave Jesus at home and I'm going to go to this little concert. I'm going to go hook up my girlfriend. The Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, is in you. He shows up wherever you go and whatever you're doing. So that is what the Holy Spirit does. Now, this is what it says here. We have to analyze our lives. And what are we doing? Our actions. Jesus talks about true disciples in verse 23. Not everyone who calls out on me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Okay, this is where it gets really sketchy. This is out of Jesus' mouth, by the way. On judgment day, he's talking about life after death. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And we perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Or in another translation, the King James, you workers at iniquity. So these guys right here, these guys gave their life to Christ at some point, And God was using them. This is like people that were Christians. So if people believe in once saved, always saved, I don't know. This verse kind of like shuts that whole thing down. And I wouldn't take the chances with eternity. Imagine being this person. Like, Lord, you used me. I was an evangelist. I spoke at Calvary Chapel. I was in. No, Ryan. You constantly kept watching porn. You were stealing money. Your heart was far from me. You work with iniquity. You were a poser. Now you go where posers go. The fakes, the phonies, the hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. This is gnarly stuff, right? I'm like... This is scary stuff, but this is real. This is, this is why John the Baptist story was in here four times in the Gospels. This is the essentials of the, go- this is the, essentials of the gospel of the relationship of Christ is repentance and the power of the Holy Spirit. This, this is what shifts atmospheres in rooms is the power of the Holy Spirit. So going back, we're going to be ending here. Sorry, this is getting intense. Okay, so it goes on to say this. I baptize, so John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water. But though um, I baptize you, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is far greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy even to be a slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you. He's talking about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff and and from the wheat with the wind fork, and he will clean up the threshing area, gather the wheat into the barns, but burning the chaff with a never-ending fire. Okay, so let's address a couple things here in closing. Number one, John's like, I baptize you with water. So when you give your life to Christ, and you're like, dude, God, let's do this. I'm making a public statement. You're like all in, okay? Then what happens is you get baptized with water, when you get baptized with water, basically it's a, it's, a, it's a demonstration of where you're at with your heart with Christ. I wouldn't recommend getting baptized when you first get, become a Christian. Make sure you're like, you're in it to win it, right? You're not just going to go back for the cares of the world or for some girl that you're in it. Now, when you get baptized, what happens is he, uh, you go into the water, and the water represents, type of, uh, it represents like the living water of the Holy Spirit. You go into the water, and when you go and dunk into the water, you, you hold you down, and then that's leaving the old man, the grave. The old wine reefs in the grave, and you come out that new spirit led life. That water, that water represents the living water. So there's the water baptism. Doesn't save you, but do it because it's amazing. And there's, there'll be a shift in your life too when that happens. There's something about that, man. It, it, God does something at that time. Then there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in Acts 1 8 to the disciples, hey, before you start your public ministry, before you go out and start living the Great Commission, because before, they were just rolling with Jesus and watching and learning. They were getting discipled, right? They weren't actually sent out into ministry. They were new. 
believers at this point. Listen to the studies. And remember, Peter failed. He denied Jesus three times. Why? Because they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit, but they didn't have the power source. That's why Jesus says, you guys go and post up in Jerusalem and Acts 1.8, he says, but when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fire and power, that's when you're going to go, and you're going to go tear it up. And immediately when the Holy Spirit fell on them in the day of Pentecost, they saw like tongues of fire. They got baptized and filled with the Spirit. Immediately, Peter stepped forward. I love that word, step forward. Boom, that faith. Step forward, and then the, act, the, faith, the faith was activated. The Holy Spirit came upon him. He preached an epic sermon. And boom, hundreds of thousands got saved right there on the spot. And the church started. So he, he's saying, I'm going to baptize you to prove that you repent of your sins. But King Jesus is coming because I'm the forerunner. And when he comes, you're going to get the power and you're going to get the fire. And the fire is what, when he's talking about that, that wheat here, what they do is they used to step on the wheat and break it up. And then the the, the chaff from the, the wheat would fall on the ground. That's the useless stuff. Then they'd get the wind fork and they'd fan it, and it would blow away. They'd gather it and throw it into the fire. That is the useless stuff. That's the, that's the depression, the anxiety, the suicide, the porn addiction, the drug addiction, the hopelessness, the emptiness, all that stuff that's in your life that Satan is plaguing you because he's a fisherman and he's hooked you, and you've got these strongholds and these photos the Bible, Bible talks about, and they're connected to you. God's going to break that stuff with the fire, just like gold, when it has that black spots on it, you put it into the fire, it refines and it turns pure, and that is the fire of the Holy Spirit. Fire of the Holy Spirit isn't dancing around, acting like a clown, rolling on the ground and being like, I'm on fire, the Holy Ghost. That stuff ain't real, but there's power. I've seen people get healed. We've casted demons out of people. I've seen power of the Holy Spirit. We've laid hands on people, and we've seen their hands shaken from the, the, the power of them getting baptized with the Holy Spirit, not falling on the ground or anything, but there is power. There is real, pure power in the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, right now. We've seen it. I've seen it so much. So that's what they're talking about. Someone's coming. You're going to get the power, and then you're going to go tear it up. But don't, don't do anything until you get the power, right? Because then you're going to be like Peter, and you're going to blow it. <laughs> so... Here we go. In, in closing, it says this. Verse 13. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one that needs to get baptized by you. Now remember, Jesus was the son of God, right? So John is his cousin. He saw the way he acted growing up. And there was something different about the way Jesus represented himself because he's the son of God, right? So he sees him, and he's probably like, dude, like, you're, like, way better than me. Like, you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't baptize you. And a fun note about Jesus is Jesus came from Nazareth. Remember, they go, hey, we found the, we found the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. And Thomas is like, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? This guy came from, like, a neighborhood, like, a little, like a rough neighborhood. Jesus grew up, construction worker. He had an edge to him. He wasn't, like, polished whatsoever. You hear him calling out the Pharisees on them. He's kind of a rough, rough guy. I'll tell you that. He did not play games, but his grace and his mercy and his love for people, the way he conducted himself was just amazing. Just tearing it up in the city, loving people to death, healing people, and just dying on the cross. I mean, what, what else can you say about that? So here he is. He says, baptize me. And then John, John finally, uh, Jesus says, it, uh, he goes, you baptize me. And he goes, Jesus says, no, it should be done for us to carry out what God requires. So always Jesus submitting to the Father. Not our will, his will be being done. After his, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the waters, the heavens were open and he saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove and settle it on him. And the voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Here you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one working together. Father, Father God is in heaven. Jesus came on a rescue mission, died for the sins of the world, resurrected, defeating Satan on the cross. He's sitting at the right hand of Father God. As we pray to God for intercession, in Jesus' name, I ask that you help me with this. Lord, please help me with this. He has the Holy Spirit that's in us. And, and, and what happens is we pick up off the signals and we operate and we start moving and operating in power as the gifts of the Holy Spirit manifest. They come alive when we step 
forward into it. It turns on that faith. And if you believe, you will receive and you will see atmospheres changes and you will see God do incredible things. God working supernaturally just in the natural realm. Nothing weird whatsoever. And your mind will be blown. In the end, I'm going to end it with this verse. As I told you, I went through the hardest season of my life. God, no more of these, please. Can't take it. I'm too old. I'm going to end it with this verse from Jesus. Um, Matthew 7, verse 24. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds their house on the solid rock. Remember, Jesus is the rock. Remember in, um, in uh, Caesarea Philippi, where they were doing all that demonic stuff, uh, worshiping the god of Pan and having orgies and, 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 and blood sacrifice with stuff. And Jesus took his disciples. Talking about Jesus being radical, Jesus took his disciples there. And he's all, on this rock? Because they used to think that was the, the, the porthole, the, gate, the gateway to hell there where Jesus took them. You know, people are like, I'm not going to go and do ministry in those places. Jesus took his disciples to where they thought it was the gate of hell, where they were sacrificing and having orgies and worshiping the God of Pan. Does it get more radical than that? And he goes, on this, he's all, on this rock, the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus is the rock. And he says, if you build your house on the rock, though the rain comes and the torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind Beats against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on the rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey is foolish, like a person who builds their house on the sand. When the rain and the floods come and the wind beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. I survived by the skin of my teeth this season literally because the enemy wanted to sift me. He wanted to destroy me. He wanted to ruin my family. He wanted to ruin my ministry. He wanted to ruin everything that God has done in my life. But because I built my house on the rock and I was holding on because Jesus is the word, the word became flesh. And I held on to the word of God like it was life or death because it was. When the rains came and the torrents crashed, I wouldn't, my house did not get swept away. I didn't get swept away by God's grace. And I'm going to end it here. If you want to receive Jesus Christ in your life, for the first time, if you want to receive Jesus, or if you want to give your back, life back to the Lord because you fell away, Satan's been hooking you with hooks, and he's been getting you, maybe you've just been off course, you need to get back on that track. Or maybe you've just been wiling out like the prodigal son. We all know that story. Spent all his money wiling out, all those, all those checks coming in from the government. Um, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? God loves you, and he has a plan for you. And I, when we pray and you repent of your sins, God's going to forgive you of all your sins, and he's going to wash you white as snow. And not only that, when we pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive peace. Why? Because Jesus said it. If not, he's fake. This whole thing's fake, and it's not real. John 7, Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to me, and I will give you the living water. And living water is the peace, the paracletus. He comes alongside and fills you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you want that, stick your thumbs up, and I want to pray for you right now. Awesome. I see you. Anyone else? Heck yeah, there's a lot of you. Anyone else? Come back to the Lord or give your life to the Lord. Get back on track. Heck yeah. All right. Come up here. I'm going to pray for you guys. All you guys come up here. I'm going to pray for you. And not only that, if you're a Christian and you're walking with God, but you feel like Satan has all these strongholds, these footholds the Bible talks about. You're a Christian, but Satan has these hooks on you, and he's, he, you can't get free. Come forward, and I'm going to pray that God's going to break those chains and set you free today. That's what it's all about. This is the medic tent. This is why we're here. And maybe you're a Christian and you're like, dude, I'm dry. I'm in the desert. I need the living water. God is going to fill you with the fire and the power of your Holy Spirit. Come forward and I'm going to pray that you get filled with the Spirit today as well. This is for everybody that is just ready for God to do something special today. He's doing it, and he's going to do it. We're going to sing this song, The Waymaker. I love this song. This song I was gripping onto because I needed God to make a way in my life in this season.
there's more if God's knocking on your heart and your heat your heart's beating he wants that relationship just come up this is why we're here step forward and watch what God's gonna do I know there's more just come forward we're gonna sing it one more time as the Holy Spirit moves and draws you he'll draw you all man to himself he wants a relationship you're never too far gone you haven't committed the unpardonable sin he loves you and he wants to touch your life and he wants to transform you this is not about dead religion this is about a relationship and the power from the son of god and the holy ghost let's see even when i don't see stop working you never stop you never stop working yes, even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working oh you never stop working yes, even when i don't see it you're working
call, I feel like I just know there's more. And this is a hard thing to do. It's a punk rock decision. It's the craziest decision of your life. But it's the most rewarding. And God loves you and he sees you. He loves you. I just, what he can do in us and through us, it's amazing. And the, sun, the fun doesn't stop. It just begins. You live that amazing life that God has for you. That's cool. I see you guys coming up. Just keep coming. Come and get what God has for you. There's always those people that are like, if he says it one more time, I'm going to go. Come up. Come and get the feeling of the spirit. Get all your sins forgiven. That's what it's all about. God, I just pray if there's anyone here that's just warring right now. If they're warring, Lord, break through. Break through what the enemy is trying to do in their life. He's trying to hold them back from that life abundantly, Lord. They've been slaves to sin. They've been torn down. They've been just oppressed and fogginess and depression over them. And they're just stuck in this rut. But you've come to set people free, Lord. So I pray in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus, that you just set them free now and that you break through and let them come down and let them receive everything that you have for them, God. Don't let them buy into the lies of the enemy anymore. It's over today. Today they start hearing God's voice. I see you guys coming up. Do it. This is what it's all about. Awesome. I see you too. I feel like the Holy Spirit's still moving right now. Holy Spirit, keep moving. I pray that you pour out your spirit in here and that you will continue to work on those hearts, Lord, and that you will break through those hard hearts, Lord. Move now by your power, of the torrents of living water, Lord. Just move on the minds and the hearts. Illuminate their minds, Lord, and reveal yourself, even if you want to release pictures into the minds of some that need to see those pictures, God, of how you see them and how you love them, God, and the plans that you have for them, Lord. Speak to them and break them, break through and let them know that you can set them free. But they have to surrender. They have to trust, and it's hard for them to trust. They have to let that go today, and they got to quit holding on to that stuff that they're holding on to and not, not trusting. And that's the only thing that's setting them back right now. And I feel that's for somebody in here that they need to let it go now. In Jesus' name. There's that resentment, the bitterness. Some are holding on to that anger and they don't want to let it go. We have to forgive. We have to forgive so God can move in us it's those strongholds that I'm talking about. It's those strongholds and those footholds that you hold on to that keeps us away from that relationships. It, 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 it stops the power, the connection, because we're holding on. And we're not trusting God that he could come in and he could heal and he could remove and he can do the work. So you just keep holding on to that stuff. But today's the day you got to let it go and give it to God. you got to let that baggage go and leave it here today. And let God do it. So we're going to pray now. I see a couple more people coming up. If that's you, come up now. All right. We're going to pray. Come up right now. If there's that last person that's just like, I'm going to do it, but I'm scared. Just push up. We're going to pray for you right now. You guys coming up too? Awesome. There's more. There's more. Keep coming. Let's go. This, this is an amazing moment. You shouldn't feel down. You should be excited. Like, I'm doing this. Jesus is about to touch my life. This is exciting. And we've all done it in the crowd. So we're like, yes, we're rooting for you. 
This is awesome. There's no con condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because Jesus is about to forgive and forget, and it's on. I see you getting up too. Come up. Come receive all that he has for you. You will never thirst again. He will give you the living water, which is the Holy Spirit. There's more coming. I see you. We're going to wait as they come. The Holy Spirit's moving. See, this is the thing about the Holy Spirit. He just moves and flows and touches people's hearts and their minds. And he draws all man to himself. That's all he does. He just works on their hearts. But it's up to us to step forward and make that step of faith and go, all right, God, I hear you. You're talking to me. Let's do it. And then God does it. We open the door, and he comes in. And that's how it all goes down. Okay, we're going to pray. All right, now because this isn't dead religion, this is a relationship, all you have to do is when you say this prayer, you just mean it in your heart. And God knows your heart. And what happens is when you confess your sins, he's going to forgive you. All that's going to be done. Your sins are going to be cast in the deepest part of the ocean. And are you coming up too? Well, come on up. Let's do this. He's going to cast your sins in the deepest part of the ocean, and he'll never bring them up again. How good is that? Then he's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And now you're going to come alive spiritually. And God's going to start talking to you as you open the Bible. It's going to come alive as you read it. And the more you read it, the more he's going to speak to you. And things are going to start happening. And when you pray and things happen, don't, you're going to be surprised. And you're going to know God's even real. And he loves you. You're his children. So let's just say this say, prayer out loud. Say, Jesus, Jesus. Forgive, me forgive me of all my sins. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Thank, you Thank you for the forgiveness. Wash me white as snow with the blood that was shed on the cross. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to pray over you. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, split the sky and send your Holy Spirit. Baptize them with the fire and the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you will start working on their hearts, those ones that have been hard, Lord. I pray that you soften them in Jesus' name. Those ones that have had things happen to them as youngsters through bad situations with family members or rape or abuse, brokenness, being molested, God, I pray that you will allow, encourage them to give that to you now. And, Lord, I pray that you will flood them and that you will heal them and that you will touch their heart, that you will reign in their life and that they will encounter peace supernaturally from heaven like living water falling from their head to their feet, that you will fill them up and that you will rip out everything that's not of you with the refining fire of the Holy Ghost and that you will break all strongholds that have been attached to them from the enemy, even if things have been opened through the supernatural realm, through Ouija boards, tarot cards, even through pharmacia, drugs and alcohol, things that have opened doors, that you will break it, that you will seal them with the blood on the shed on the cross, and that you will literally put a hedge of protection, a fire over them, God, and that you will send your warrior angels to be with them and protect them. But more importantly, Jesus, go with them. I pray that you will release the gifts of the Holy Spirit on them so people can start moving in the power and the giftings that you have for them, God. I pray that you will increase faith in this room because you can do nothing without faith. God, I pray that you get rid of all fear and all doubt, Lord, and that you will let them hear your voice clearly at this time and that you will use them for great things. And God, I pray for healing over their bodies, God. Anything physical, disease, whatever, aches, pains, knees, bones, cancer, God, I ask by your grace, because you are the healer, that you will heal people according to your will. In Jesus' name, we pray for healing power, that that pains will dissolve and they will be healed and they will testify of your goodness because you are the great physician. And those ones you don't heal, give them the grace, Lord. Like Paul, he prayed he didn't get healed, but you gave him the grace because your grace is sufficient. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> Listen up. Listen up, listen up. Love you, man. Listen, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be out there at the booth. 
Uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to have the books out there. You can buy them on Amazon if you don't want to wait in line. I will sign your book if you want it signed. Uh, whatever's clever, I'm down, I'm available. There's Bibles over here for free Bibles for you guys. Get connected. And I love you guys so much, man. Thank you for sharing. <laughs>